We are believing for miracles, signs, and wonders to take place. We want people to be able to get delivered. We want them set free. We want them to be healed in Jesus' name. Um, whatever it is that they're believing God for, we want to be able to touch and agree for the will of God to be completed, to be done in their lives in Jesus' name. So we're going to need a team of people just here praying, just praying. And so we can pray from 1145 to 1230, right? We can do a 45 minute prayer, right? So being here praying, and then there'll be some of us who are still there at the site, um, making sure that nobody just takes off with the food because that would be embarrassing, you know, but <laughs> walking out the door. And so, um, because we're backed up into our areas, backed up into the field, it's wide open. So there, there's no leaving it. So, um, there'll be some lunch there for those of us who stick around. Several other people said, I'm just there for the startup. I'm not there for the serving, which is fine. That's fine. Um, right now we are over, what did I say? 70, 70 volunteers, you guys, y'all can give God some praise. Hallelujah. So we are at 70 volunteers. The Lord has done so much to bless this event. I mean, it has been something, um, from the very beginning and anytime you see this much warfare, when God has placed you to do something and stuff's just popping off all over the place and people are falling off and people aren't showing up and people aren't doing this and they're not doing that. You can look at it and you can believe one of two things. You can believe you missed God and this isn't what he said, or you can stand firm on the word of God and move forward and see it all the way through to fruition until you hear mission complete, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I am here to tell you that is what we have had to do. I have been singing for the last two weeks. I don't know all the lyrics to this song. All I know is she says, I'm talking about a big God, a big God. And I, yes, I posted it the other day. No, not CC Winans. Um, I can't remember the girl's name. Yeah. But she said, the only remedy for big odds is a big God. And I've just been singing it, singing it, singing it through the tears, through the fears, through the everything, because this has been hard, but God has made y'all. Yes. When I tell you he's made a way today, when I got the phone call, the phone call was dropping every five minutes because I was coming back from Oskaloosa, but they were like, we're going to be there. The police officers called me right before I made it to Oskaloosa. We're going to be there. We're going to be serving. I mean, people are coming out the woodworks. I was telling Terry and George, I was sitting there wearing, how in the heck am I going to get a dang on um, forklift? And this young lady has never met me a day in her life. When she found out that my partner had gone a different direction and wasn't going to be a part of it. And that's the one who had recruited her. She hunted me down and said, Hey, are we still doing this? And I said, the Lord didn't tell me to stop. She said, then I'm going with you. Not only do we have a forklift, we have all the tables, we have all the chairs. I mean, God is making a way out of no way. Then here come the doctors when the doctors all of a sudden disappeared on Thursday of last week, I get in a text message that made no sense saying we have no doctors. Now, all of a sudden here we have doctors and a nurse practitioner and a nurse to help. Come on, y'all. That is our God. We got to stand in faith, walk by faith with faith. We got to show the world who our God really is. We can't do it if we sit back and hide. If every time something goes wrong, we stop believing. We have to choose to believe all the way through. If we're going to preach that he's in the fire with us, we got to show the world he's in the fire with us. Amen. And we're coming out without a hint of smoke. That's our God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So yeah, it, it's been good. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can I make a comment? Yes, ma'am. With the microphone. Yes. <laughs> That's my comment. I watched last week's study and many people had their microphone back here. You could not understand them. We, you could get a word every now and again. So I just wanted to, again, encourage everybody, pull it close, even though it feels weird, get right up on the thing because 
there was many powerful things that happened last week. Many powerful things, words that I needed to hear, words that had I stayed in the house and had I heard those words, maybe my weekend with my grandkids would have been different because Pastor O.C. shared something that I actually went through. Those that were here knew he said how he dealt with his boys and anger. Yes. I had a grandson that I went off on. Now I have to go back and repent ask for forgiveness, but I got a whole week to wait because he's on vacation with his parents. So had I heard that, that would have been fresh in my mind. I may have behaved differently Come on, Terry. because there was a spirit there and I let that spirit punk me and I'm tired of being punked by the other spirits. So that's what I wanted to share. So pull that very close. Hold, hold up, just in case for y'all who are listening now, she said, if I had stayed where? In the house. Do you realize what you just said? Mm -hmm. If I had stayed in the house, mm -hmm. if we would stop being so easily moved out of the house when we're tired or when we don't feel like it or when something's going wrong, half of the stuff that we're battling still, we wouldn't be. We got to learn how to be still and know that he is God. Man, Ooh. yeah, Lord, this is good. <laughs> so I want to welcome everyone to Bible study tonight. Amen. Jesus, Christ. today is Thursday, August the fifteenth of twenty twenty four. In Jesus' name, um, yeah, y'all know how we do it. We just move with God, so we can do the formality. But I think, as I mentioned last week, we're a we're just truly a kingdom purpose training center. And part of that training is going to happen in real time. I think when people hear the word training, they always think about the sense of um, you learn something and then you go apply it. But there's not always an emphasis on you learn it while you're on the battlefield or you learn it while you're moving forward and understand there's a deafness there. So if y'all wonder why I'm kicking back, it's because I'm just like soaking up everything that y'all are saying. It's, it is reassuring on multiple fronts how what when you release what God says and it's like, I don't know why I'm saying this account again, to be like, oh, that's why, praise God, and able to give him the glory for it. Um, you have to forgive me because I did the Bible study on YouTube for the youth last night. And I realized I kind of went off about boasting about God. Um, we were talking about the book of Judges mm -hmm. and talking about um, how the cycle they went through, it's feel like generational where you had the generation that found peace with God, anchored himself in God and there was peace. Then someone or the, the you had a generation that then forgot about God who did not know who he is and did evil in his sight. God had to pretty much cause sin to hit them. They had to call out for a judge called for God to save him and then he did and the cycle happened over and over again and I mentioned how when you look at those accounts when those generation did something evil in God's eyes a lot of it was big upon they no longer follow the God's words right. to do what he said that do what he instructed them to do and it's very interesting because judges happens after the children of Israel has begun to occupy the promised land mm -hmm. There's far so long we talk about, we're going to our promised land. We're going to our promised land. God's going to get us into our promised land. We'll even say we've entered the promised land. But God is not a God who just settles with us going to our promised land and sitting in a promised land. He's looking for us to, to thrive and to flourish and to grow in the promised land. That's right. And the same God who got us out of captivity through the wilderness season, seeing the door of the promised land, going through the promised land, is the same God who has a plan for us in the promised land, no. so we never leave the promised land, and we're able to pass on that godly inheritance to the next generation so that they can live and thrive in the promised land that God allowed for us to fight for them. Amen. And where the passion came from me last night is, I'm tired of our youth and the generation not knowing about God and losing out on the promise and the joy and all the things God has for them because we're not doing our job. Yeah. Yes. Whatever that task may be, 
with whoever it may be. We're not doing our job to pass it along. That's the spirit of selfishness. When we're not willing to pass on to the next generation so that our ceiling becomes their floor. And so the passion came out to tell them, do not boast about yourselves, especially in this society that's about I, 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 and what I did and what I did. Those moments is where God wants us to boast about him, to glorify him in the midst of it. So I thank God that in this setting, we are boasting about what he did and we're not just settling at that, but we're saying we see where the connection will be moving forward. Amen. 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 So with that, I'm going to move us forward because I know we're going to freestyle and probably put in some things along the way that we have encountered this past week. But as the crew that was here last week realized, I really want to get into Ephesians 5. But I wanted to be obedient and do Ephesians 4 to make sure we close that loop. And so we are going to get into Ephesians 5, but I want to, um, number one, pray. Number two, um, make sure we kind of close the book on Ephesians 4 when we get into Ephesians 5. Man. Sounds like a plan? Awesome. Do I have someone who would like to pray us in this evening? All right. Heavenly Father, gracious and holy Lord Jesus, we just uh, we thank you, Lord God. We we do repent for for the sins that we commit uh, willingly and unwillingly, Lord God. Father, we just uh, we want to be able to give you the glory, and and we just we need you frequently to help us do just that. So, Lord God, I, I thank you. I thank you for all of the leadership here at New Beginnings. Lord God, I thank you for what you're doing in this community and through this or uh, through this church, Lord. And um, Father God, I just pray that you continue to open our hearts, open up our minds to to see you in a new and a fresh way. So, Lord God, we just uh, we we want to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. 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 And so before we go any further, I want to make sure we do welcome our new family here. I got them on camera. We can go ahead and clap it up for them. Yeah. It's you guys. So, yeah, that's you guys. <laughs> so do you want to grab a mic and just introduce your family to us once again, Mr. Mark? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I believe there is no stranger in the house of the Lord. Yeah. So once I'm here, I'm already part of the family. And then Next to me is my beautiful wife. Next to her is my beautiful daughter. So we are part of the family now. So please. Yes, I'm Mark Masakoy. This is my wife, Zaina Masakoy. Adama Masakoy. Thank you for that. Amen. Amen. All righty. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have been focusing kind of this, our summer series. It is still in the vein of soul under control. It's still under the the caption that we've been focused on um, in our Bible study. But Elder Ron has really kind of taken us through this investigation of the book of Ephesians. And I use the words investigation on purpose because we've really been slowing this down and really breaking um, what is there down so that we get all that's from it. And so on last week, we picked up at Ephesians 4, verse 17, and we was able to spend time really kind of to verse 19. And we noticed that in that moment that God was really highlighting this contrast of walking as a Gentile and what that means the details of it. And it's very interesting because before you get to that portion in Ephesians 4, he is really already highlighting all the things that they're going to do. He's already highlighting and outlining really things to kind of put in position of what he's desiring. He's already talking about positions. When we talk about the, um, the apostle, the pastors, the teacher, the prophet evangelist, he's really giving structure. And then he throws this in 
as a reminder of what it looks like to walk like a Gentile, thinking about those that are still in the city of Ephesus, that's still there, and reminding the church to don't go back to who you were. Don't go back to the former self. But in fact, when we look at verses 20 through really the end of that chapter 32, we see a switch that God navigates the people through of something that they used to do as a Gentile, how to use that or to switch it to be used in alignment to what God's word said in, in the character. So an example, when he said to stop lying, he said, then use your words to speak blessings. He's talked about, don't let anger control you. Don't let the sun go down. Don't let things fester. But then he came back and mentioned, how do you do that? It's settling things before the sun go down so that there's not a place for the enemy to be able to land. Um, he says, stop stealing. But then he says, do something else probable with your hands. So it's not just saying, don't do it. It's don't do this, but do this instead. And at times we only hear the don't do, we don't hear that transition to what to do instead. That's right. And so God took them through or through the writing, um, with, through Paul, he was walking this church through what that switch should look like, how to still use the skills they obtain, but to do it for God's purpose and for God's assignment, mm -hmm. which is interesting that Paul's the one saying it because as he had his encounter with God on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, he never lost all the historical information he got as a youth. That's it. And growing up, what happened was the all the information got transferred to be used from killing Christians to building up Christians. Yes. From destroying them and taking their lives to actually showing them how they continue to walk with God, who God is, and to encourage them along the way. So it was interesting that out of Paul's really testimony, he started to share that with the churches, um, even with him being locked up in various cities. He still used that as an opportunity to share with them that it is possible and it's from himself. This is when we talk about, I'm an epistle. Like what I'm doing, I'm showing you what God can do, that it is possible. Because there's people who don't know, who don't believe that it is possible to live a life with God. There are people who literally think that is impossible. But the Bible clearly says, tells us with God, all things are possible. So whatever it may be called impossible, the word says that, that that's not true. It is possible with God, not without God, with cause for that relationship with God to be necessary. Good. You have to forgive me. I just came from doing like a retreat. So my brain is still in education mode and checkpoint. So if I do that, my my brain is on that check-in and what have you. So just so you know where I'm coming from and where it's at. So anyway, moving on. So with that, we're going to turn the page and start to look at Ephesians 5. We're going to start at verse number one. And just as another kind of making sure we're all on the same page, PowerPoint. There we go. Yep. When we talk about um, when we talk about from the series we've been focusing on with the book of Ephesians, we are still in that walking section. Um, when you refer to watching these books, sit, walk, stand. Yes. We're still in the walking segment. So that's why you're hearing us continue to use the word walking. As a quick reminder, when you hear the word walk or walking, what comes to mind? As Movement. Jesus went. Movement. Hmm? As Jesus went. As Jesus went. Direction. Going from one place to another. Okay. So we're all clear this is not a stationary part of this journey, right? Right. Like there's movement that has to occur. There is actions that are necessary. Walking is an action. We all agree with that, right? Okay. So as we go through, we want to keep in mind that we're in that walking phase and there's a movement, especially from one place to another. We want to definitely highlight that there is a destination as we go through this. Make sense? Amen. Amen. 
So let's start with Ephesians 5, verse 1, and we're going to go all the way down to verse 2. Such a long verse, right? So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Is there anybody who would love to read those two verses? I can read. Go ahead. Just make sure to speak into the mic for me, please. Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, right? Yes. Okay. It said, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also have loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savor. When you talked about being imitators, um, one of the things that came to my mind is I remember when we moved here, I was in the fifth grade, um, leaving the fourth grade, like the last month of fourth grade and going into fifth grade. And then from there, of course, you know, went to junior high, but I can remember being so sure of myself when I was in Akron, Ohio when I was in the place that I'm from, I was so sure of myself. I was confident. Um, I had family around me. I looked like them. Things felt normal. But as I left Akron and moved here to a place where people didn't look like me, they didn't sound like me. I had an accent different than theirs. Um, and, you know, over time, I, I sound more like people from Iowa. I don't sound like I'm from Ohio anymore. But it was interesting to see that I began to imitate the people around me. And as I imitated the people around me, I lost me. I lost me. I no longer sounded like myself. I no longer dressed like myself. I didn't know who I was anymore because I'd become something to fit in with the people who were here instead of being who I was and getting the people to transition and transfer into who I am. As Christians, we make that mistake. We want to fit in with the world. And where we mess up is we are supposed to be the ones that change and transform the culture. Yet we allow the culture to transform. Y'all with me tonight? We allow the culture to transform us, to shape and to mold us. We allow fear of not fitting in with the world, fear of not looking like everyone else, fear of not sounding like they do. We allow that fear to stop, block, and hinder us from being developed into the unique, beautiful person that God designed us to be. He, he wants us to be peculiar. He wants us to be different. We don't have to fit in. We don't have to look like anybody except for who God made us to be. And if we would embrace ourselves as he designed us to be, we would be so much happier. Now, it doesn't mean that the entire world is going to accept us, right? And the Bible actually speaks against that. It says that if everybody likes you, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. So if we focus on being imitators of Jesus Christ, and, and for you, my sister, when they start to ask you, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you drink? Why don't you smoke? Why don't you cuss? Why don't you drop it like it's hot? When they begin to ask you those questions, for so long, I didn't know the answer to that. But I do now. And I wish someone had told this to me a lot sooner. The answer is this, because it doesn't glorify God. That's it. And they can argue with God if they have a problem with what I don't do. It does not glorify God for me to act in that manner, for me to be high, for me to be drunk, for me to pop pills, for me to have sex out of wedlock. It does not glorify God, period. And if you want to argue that, argue it with him. Even down to with this election, people are, they're not real happy about the fact that I'm not jumping on their bandwagons one way or the other. And what I am saying very clearly is this, I will vote what my convictions are. That is what I'm going to vote. Whether you like it, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, I don't care. But I am going to vote according to what the word of God says because I am voting for what I wanna see in the future. How I vote today is going to impact my grandkids, y'all. 
My grandkids are about to head into junior high and one's going to high school. Actually, two. Yeah. Two are in high school, headed to high school this year. So let's be clear. Whatever I vote is going to determine what they're going to have to live with when they're an adult. The person that's sitting here right now is impacting what's happening in the future. So whether we're going to be a godly nation or not is going to determine how we vote today. So we have to take this election seriously. And we got to look at the word and see what the word of God says. And we have to vote according to what the word of God says in order for our nation to continue in a righteous momentum or it's going to die, burn, crash, and go to hell. And that's, that's what we're going to be living as the elderly in that hell that we voted for today. I need us to pay attention to what I'm saying and really start to look through the rhetoric, look through all that's being promised, look at what's being said, look at what they voted for in the past because that tells their heart. Pay attention to how they voted in the past. It's going to let you know what their heart is today, what their motives are, and what their intent is for America. Because we're going to find ourselves in the next 15, 20 years living out what we voted today, y'all. The effects of what happened two presidencies ago is hitting us. That's what we're living out right now. Pay attention to what's going on. Do your research. Don't just go with the crowd. Stick with God. Amen. Amen. Sure. Looking at Ephesians 5 and 2. So we talked about the, verse 1, therefore be imitator of God as their children. And by the way, Rhonda, if I'm off with where we're at in Ephesians, I apologize. Okay. Hey, we just double check it. But um, verse number 2, it says, let me show more. Okay. It says, and walk in love as Christ also had loved us and given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and aroma. So we are charged to be imitator of God as their children. And then the next thing that pops up is to walk in love. Why do you think that that statement of walk in love was even written for these people? Like, why is that phrase walk in love seem so important? Because love is said two times at least in this verse. So why is walking in love so important? Why do you think it's so important based on where you're, where we're at? Yes, sir. Probably because God is love. Because God is love. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you love him, that means you must love anybody like yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep, because God is love. Anyone else? When I think about um, the importance of walking in love, I go back to the Garden of Eden. And I think about the rejection that Adam felt when they fell. When he and Eve messed up the rejection that they must have felt and how that rejection passed down after they left the garden or were rejected and kicked out. Um, and they had children look at what that spirit of rejection that passed through the womb and to their child. What did it do? It caused Cain to do what murder Abel. And God had to ask him, you know, why are you cast down? Why, why are you so dejected? What's going on with you? Why do you feel rejected? Don't you realize that if you do well, that you'll be accepted? And so because Cain felt a lack of love, he literally ended up trying to destroy the person that he felt was taking his shine away, right? And so he killed his brother, 
you know, and, and pretended like he didn't do it so that he could receive all the glory. He could receive all the praise. When we don't have love, it causes us to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. When we don't feel loved, um, that's when we find ourselves falling for anything when it comes to lust. We exchange lust for love, and that's how we find ourselves in the positions that we find ourselves in. Um, all these ungodly soul ties, all of that comes from the spirit of rejection. Mm -hmm. So we have to walk in love not only for others so that they don't feel that rejection, but we also need to walk in love for ourselves because just as our brother said, God is love. And if we're imitators of Christ, that part. Jesus Christ walked in love. So we're going to imitate Christ and walk in love in the same way. Amen. And no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, just thinking about like the overview of Ephesians, the sit, walk, stand, and, you know, this really is showing us how to walk. And I was going to say, like Apostle said, you know, the verse before it says, be imitators of Christ and walk in love. You know, and one of the things that Randall said, I don't know if it was last time or the time before, but he talked about walking in that forgiveness, like mm -hmm. having that readiness to forgive. He said, I can't wait till somebody does something to me so I can forgive them. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah. Something did happen. I'm sorry. Something did happen and he shared it. A person stole their car. And I believe it was that following that night, someone stole their car that same night that he released that, that, he released that word. And the person he woke up, went to go to work that morning. And next minute, you know, there's no car out there. So they call the police and the police saw the person's, um, driving out of the city, you know, maybe an hour or so before it. And what was even more um, amazing about it is the Lord had woke him up and he's like, I need to go outside. And Katrina's like, you don't have to go to work for another hour and a half, lay back down. It's okay. Well, he's like, I feel like I need to go outside. And she said, just go on and lay back down. He gets up and goes, goes to go to work and the car is stolen. The first thing that the Lord had him to do was forgive that person so as soon as he released that the test came and guess what they got the car back without a scratch on man yep and i think that's important to that it is it is important when we talk about the love that we that god has shared with us and that he wants us to exude from us I want to make sure it's perfectly clear. We're not talking about just every time we get to love, I always want to make sure that we understand what love actually means to God. Yeah. Because there is a conception that love means allowing anything to happen. And that's not the love that God is referring to. If we link it back to being imitated like their children, the Bible tells us clearly that if you love your ch children, you're going to have that standard for them out of love to let them know when they are out of compliance, if you will, <laughs> because you love them enough to show them where the boundary is at, to be able for them to know I have crossed the line and I'm getting snapped back to where I should be. He says in his word, he chastises those that he loves. Testament means discipline. <laughs> Testament means correction. It means something is off. And God loves us enough not to just let us go, but to give us an opportunity yeah. to get it back right and get back in alignment and, and to adjust it in Jesus' name and to be able to learn the lesson from that account. He also loves us enough to let us know, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yeah. So when we talk about the, when we talk about walking in love, love requires us to display God's standard. Amen. Holding God's standard is a way for us to be walking in love, because God never dropped the standard He had. He supported His people, including us, 
to be able to live at the standard and to hold the standard. He never dropped the standard. It's us who dropped below the standard. Whether it's how we want to live, whether it's how we want to act, how we want to behave, or how we want to um, encourage others. It's us making that choice. And God is saying, this is the standard. I love you enough to not lower the standard. Do you realize there's a, do you, do we understand that for a lot of people, the person that they appreciate the most is the person who never lowered the standard That's it. Right. to the point where they said, when you yeah. get yourself right, yeah. I'm right here. And right the here. standard is still here. I love you enough not to lower the standard, not to lower the level of expectation, not to lower, to hold it. Even when you're fighting, even when you're fussing, what you say? Uh, mm -hmm. Mike. But at, this, at the same time, like my children, for instance, when they're mad at me, I know I'm doing my job because that's what they're mad at is the fact that I know what's in your best interest. I know what's right for you and you may not like it, but if you're mad because of a decision that I made for you and I know I don't have to question what it is that I'm doing or your reaction to it, I know I'm doing my job. I know I'm building that standard and that moral in you and you'll thank me for it later. Okay. The word is thank you and I'll wait for it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Now, but but with that, Samantha, here's the thing. Let's talk. Let's start bringing things together. How many parents want to be friends with their children oh, out of a place of hurt because they did not understand how their parent parent or they haven't forgiven their parents for what occurred? That becomes a part as well. Did I step on something? Oh, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Did I? Okay, go ahead. How many parishioners want their pastor to lower the standard? Can we talk about that today? They want us to be their friend instead of their pastor. They want us to be the one that, that rubs their head and, and tells them everything is going to be okay, but you don't want us to correct you to raise you up to the standard that the Lord wants you to have. You're not going to become who God designed you to be if we're not allowed to chastise you. Yeah. You guys will hear me say, I can't cover what I can't correct. I mean that in love. Mm -hmm. I mean that in love. Why? Because if I can't correct you, if I'm just going to stand back and let you fall in a ditch, guess what? Number one, I'm not, I'm doing you a disservice. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But number two, do you understand? I got to stand before the kid. And I'm judged twice as hard because I let you do it. And the Bible actually says that my work's going to be tested. Who's my work? Y'all, you're my work. And if you're not a reflection of me, something's wrong. Amen. You've disconnected yourself. You've detached. If you're not a reflection of me, if you're not looking like me, now you're not going to do everything exactly the way that I do it, but I should start to see signs that I'm impacting and affecting your life. There should be fruit that shows that I'm grooming you. Amen. There should be fruit. If the world has figured out grooming. Boom. That part. The world's figured it out. They groom our kids from the time that they're young. Why you think they got them sitting on Santa Claus's lap? Tell them how good they've been good. Mm -hmm. Huh? They're grooming them. And we're not even catching on. They're grooming them, preparing them to sit on a man's lap, tell them how been good you've been, and then you get a treat for it? Huh? Come on, let's think about this. Mm -hmm. If the world is grooming us and it's pushing us in a certain way, why is the church not grooming us? Why are we not being groomed in the body of Christ? We should be imitators of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul said it like this. Follow me as I follow Christ. Come on. Follow me as I follow Christ. As then and, and with me, those who have been with me, you guys are new. I'm y'all gonna get to know me. If I mess up, let's say I make a mistake, I am the first to say I did not do that right. And here's the deal. One time I got angry. <laughs> they told us that we weren't allowed to take the food and cook it <laughs> off site. 
we we get the food from the Food Bank of Iowa and we are no longer allowed to take the food off site and cook it. And Terry said, I said, well, they ain't gonna know if we cook it here or if we cook it there. And Terry said, but that's not right, Apostle. And I was so mad because they changed that rule because it makes it more difficult for us to take care of our community because that means we got to bring all of our seasonings over here, everything we need over here, be over here at five o'clock in the morning to get it done in order to utilize the food that they gave to us. And Terry was like, well, Apostle, I'm going to go back and I'm going to pray. And me and George, we were on the same page. <laughs> and I said, we're going to cook this food. We're going to feed this community. Now, here's the thing. That wasn't bad, right? Because I wanted to feed the community. It was a good thing. But was it the right thing? Good is the enemy of right. Do y'all hear that? Good is the enemy of right. So I got home and the Lord said, boop, boop, boop. and I was like, oh, shoot, hold on, hold on. <laughs> and I called and I said, hey, put me on speakerphone. <laughs> I was holding my side. <laughs> and I said, I didn't do that right. I'm sorry. I messed up. I gave you guys the wrong answer. And I don't ever want to be in a position where I lead you away from God. Because it's the little foxes that spoil the whole vine. The little foxes. It's the little stuff that we do. Yes. It starts with something that small and it morphs into something so much bigger. And see, again, we talked about the enemy being subtle. Didn't I just preach on that on Sunday? Did I? Okay. Or did I talk about it in y'all's class? I don't know. I preach enough that I don't be remembering who I say or what to. Anyway, <laughs> the enemy is subtle. Okay. He takes his time. Amen. And he's going to, he's going to work that thing so that it becomes an advantage for him and an open door for him to have access into our lives. It's little stuff like that, that gives him that open door. Once he's in there, you give him an inch. He's going to take a mile. He wants to go from a foothold to a, a man from a foothold to a what? strong amen so we cannot give him that foothold by opening the door so when you figure out that you didn't do something quite right go ahead repent turn away from it, fix it and get back on the love line with god amen, amen. if we're imitators of christ we got to get back on the love line with him we cannot be separated from him never do you see jesus christ separated from him even in his hardest moment, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that his blood or his uh, sweat became like blood. What does that mean? He was going through some stuff, y'all. He was really, it says that his soul was, was in anguish. Amen. So Jesus was going through things in his mind, his emotions. That's what your soul is made up of. Your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? So if that's the case, Jesus was going through some things, but he never separated from God. And he tells us nothing. Paul said it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We separate ourselves. So make sure that our actions keep us aligned with him. And then we don't separate. Amen. Amen. So before we move forward, questions, comments, thoughts, what's coming to mind. This is the beauty of Bible study. We can slow it down to make sure if there's misconceptions or questions that we ask them now so i was just gonna say so we're supposed to be imitators and be like christ and you said but that doesn't mean endure everything you know you were trying to explain that that doesn't mean take all the crap basically but at the same time when jesus was getting chastised and beaten and all that he took it he didn't he didn't defend himself he didn't i don't know why i'm so emotional tonight but i that's all, so I'm that's, sorry. That's all good um <clears throat> god's dealing with me on some like my purpose and stuff so i don't know it's ugh. no but you're good um good. so but he didn't like he didn't speak he just mm -hmm. took it so mm -hmm. so when you say be like jesus is that that's what comes to my mind like mm -hmm. we're supposed to take it can I speak so, to that? Yes. 
I'm glad that you brought that up because that's, that's very important. One of the things that you have to understand, and I spoke about that earlier, Jesus and his purpose, the reason why he came was to do what? What was his purpose? To come as a servant and save us. Save us how? Save us from sin how? But how did he do that? He did it on the cross. Yeah. And so he knew before he left the Garden of Gethsemane, that's why he was on the ground crying and saying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. The Lord showed him exactly what was going to happen, just as he showed Paul. Paul told the, um, I believe it was in Ephesians or Galatians, he told them, he said, I'm headed to Rome, and all I know is that a whole bunch of stuff is going to be waiting there for me, and it's not going to be good. He wrote his farewell letter. It's in Galatians. I'm looking now. Mm -hmm. he, he said, I, I'm, I'm headed there, but the Holy Spirit has let me know that what awaits me is not good. So God gave Jesus a preview, which is why he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, please. If there's any other way, he said, but nevertheless, not thy will, not my will, but thy will be done. So God showed him, now this is what I need you to do. And you preached it all the way up to this point, but now I need you to physically go through it. So when he was being whipped, he took it because he knew that there was an end to all of this, which was that he was actually going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the name above all names. He was the reconciler of men. He was the bridge between us and the uh, hell that we're living in, that we were connected to. So he did that. He took that because the Lord showed him that is what he had to suffer in order to complete his assignment. Just because Jesus did that, that was a once and done. We don't have to give our lives like that. Amen. Now, in, in our purpose, there's going to be things that we suffer. So as I've been planning this, the Lord showed me exactly what this was supposed to be. He even showed me why I have a passion for it, because that used to be me. The person who was trying to figure out how she was going to put us. Uh, shoes on the children's feet. I had three growing boys that ate up everything in my house all summer long. Then I had to turn around, put shoes on their feet, clothes on their back, make sure they had physicals, still be able to have enough gas in my car to get back and forth to work, plus pay my mortgage, plus take care of a car payment. And there was no uh, uh, child support. So he showed me this is the end result. Now I knew there was going to be some warfare. But some of the warfare I didn't anticipate to come from people close to me. Conflict can't affect you unless it's what? So some of the things you have to fight. But if he shows you that this is part of the end result, some things you have to suffer. So when we're talking about me battling cancer, when I had to go through that, I had to suffer through that. But I still thrived in all of it. I had to endure it. I had to go through losing all of my hair, the days where I didn't feel like eating, some days puking, some days couldn't go to the bathroom. You know what I mean? Just stuff. I had to go through all of that, the fatigue, the loss of memory. One time I was preaching at a, a church and Rhonda was sitting a little bit further than she is away from me. And I said, our church is founded on Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20, which says, and Rhonda mouthed it to me. And I was able to repeat it. Now, hold on. I founded this church in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, on the floor, crying before the Lord on that scripture. And I couldn't remember it. That's suffering. Could you imagine my peers sitting out there? That place was full. How many churches were in there? was ridiculous. Corinthians, you went there with me for something. I can't remember why you went with me for something over there, but it was their great big, huge gymnasium. It's a full basketball court. And it was completely packed. 
and I could not remember the scripture. Now they didn't catch it, but I knew it. And then the enemy was in my head beating me up over it. This was part of the suffering that I had to go through, which has made me who I am today. Amen. So there's some things that we will have to suffer and other things that we won't. The key is knowing the voice of God that's going to lead God and direct your steps. Because when it comes to your purpose, there's some things you're going to go through. And it usually affects you through people who are closest to you. Okay? But there's other things that he's going to have you to fight against. Through this battle with the uh, back to school stuff, I've literally had to stay on my face and keep declaring, keep decreeing, keep professing, keep proclaiming, this is what you said, this is what it's going to be. This is what you said, this is what it's going to be. And I'm not budging from it. I don't care what's going on. I'm not budging. I literally, through today, at what, two o'clock, I found out I had doctors, something like that. And I called you guys crying. I kept saying, Lord, show me the open door. Lord, show me the open door. Lord, show me the open door. Literally, I'm down to the wire. I'm what, about 48 hours and some change from the event? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about that. You gotta know the voice of God. And when he speaks, hear his voice, know his voice, heed his voice. Hear, heed, period. Amen? Amen. So he suffered because he knew that was part of the plan. Mm -hmm. The Lord showed him that was part of the plan. If he didn't show you that's part of the plan, you fight. Amen? And so I want to show the other side of what you mentioned with the battle with cancer. And that is, um, Kamika and I, mm -hmm. we both had parents who died due to cancer yeah. before her battle with cancer. So when that comes down, it ends up being a spot where we have to realize, is there a foothold that the enemy has in us? Cause we haven't fully dealt with the grieving of losing parents with that. And now we're looking at this where we have not seen a victory yet. We may have seen one close to us, but you've been the closest. So we now have to fight from position of not this time. Because we know what the end looks like. But we understand this part she's never going to tell us. But how do we, as she laid out, how do we shield her so she's able to fight that fight? Even when she doesn't want us <laughs> to shield her. Because, because we have the wisdom of knowing what it looks like to go through that battle on the sideline and having parents who did not tell us. Yeah. So then we had to find out at the last, at the bitter end or at the end of the story where then we became helpless. To a point where now we know this is the way we're going to endure and we're not being, we're not being rejected because this is where we're supposed to be. I'm not gonna be at her house seeing all the things she needs to do. I have to be the one guarding. I'm on the outside. That's the role and the purpose I feel. In the midst of it, there's healing that's going to happen for me. But in that moment, this is the role I have to fill. I'm not the one to go to the appointments with her. I'm not the one to go do all these other things. My role is to make sure she's not worried about New Beginning Discipleship Ministries. That's the role I need to fill. That if she needs something, she can't call, but it's not necessary because she knows this is the part we're taking care of. Because I know for her and for him, that if they're they're going to worry about this, but if we can take that off the plate, that's one less trick the enemy can play on them. Yeah. Because we walk through parents who was worried about their children of what's going to happen if they go and having to be tormented by it. Yeah. And we did not want that to happen. But that's the part that we had to take on. And realizing we don't need to take on all this other stuff. We play the role we needed to play for God to get the glory at the end. Amen. And so I wanted to show that part and allow for you to hear it of we didn't take it all on. We didn't say, oh, we're doing this again. No, we had a choice of how we we're going to fight this. And we even had to see, God, what role do we play? What do we do? What can we do? And to be able to and then to say yes to whatever that role may be. Because God can show us this is the role you play. But if we don't say yes, then we have not accepted the call that he's given us in the midst of this. It's no different than 
the airplane analogy when you're in the exit row that after 9-11, when they ask you're by the exit door where you have the safety, if something goes down, open the door, where the flight attendant comes and asks you, are you able to administer the steps necessary to operate the door? They need to hear you say yes, audibly. Yes. Or they got to make other plans to put somebody there who will. Right. So that's the price of wanting to get extra leg room is yeah. that are you willing to use that leg yeah. room for the betterment of the flight? Are you willing to enact this yeah. if it calls for it? To the point where there is a pamphlet in front of you that shows you what to do so that you don't have, to, you can't say, I don't know. There is something to help you. In education world, that's called a scaffold. To say, I don't know what to do. It is in words. It is in multiple languages, depending on your flight. There's images and it's in color. Now, y'all know color printing costs a whole lot of money, right? But it's, it's but, oh. right. But my point is, it's that, yes, yep, it is that important yes. to be able to still say, if you're going to say yes, you are supported. We are supported when we say yes to God's will. Yes. We have the support of God when we say yes to God's will. When we say yes, it doesn't mean we get isolated. It means we still have God with us. The kingdom of God is inside of us. And as I'm going back, kind of beginning to close the loop here for tonight's study, being an imitator of God started with being a follower with God, which means God is in front of us and near us to guide us the direction we have to go. Amen. So now when we talk about trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon all your understanding, all your ways acknowledging him and he will direct your paths. It's not just saying that God's going to say it from a seat. God is with us, helping us know which way we are to go and how to navigate this. Yes. And it says paths, which means plural. Amen. which means there's going to be twists and turns in this walk. But at every point, God is able and willing, capable and desiring to be able to show us where we are, we are to go. And we constantly have to continue to say yes, because there's multiple places where we can say no. But our continual yes to God will lead us to the expected end that he laid out for us in Jesus' name. Amen. I said wrong it was Jerusalem. And it was asked, not delivered. <laughs> I wasn't gonna bust you out. <laughs> yes. So because I'm searching, I'm like, I don't see pleasure. You found it. But I found it. Yeah. So it's at Acts 20, yes. 20, 20 to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Go to the next one. Yep. Verse 23 except that the Holy Spirit testifies that in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. So he told Paul before he even went to Jerusalem, there's going to be some trouble when you get there. Everywhere you go, you're going to deal with some stuff. So he showed Paul and he also showed Jesus. Amen. If he doesn't show you that that's what it is, gloves off. Mm -hmm. Knuckle up, guard your grill. <laughs> hey. I love us. I love us. It's, it's who we are. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and end that point because we move forward. We're going to be here for another 45 minutes and it's almost 830, so I want to honor that time. Um. So, Elder Ronda, did I do okay? We're good? Ephesians 5, we're good? Okay. I want to make sure we're at the right place. We're good? Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Amen. <laughs> Oh, no. Yep, which, which is which is fine, which is totally fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, as a reminder, um, for Sunday, um, there is a group of us that's volunteering with um, Hope in Des Moines. So, um, church, the church will be open, but it will be a prayer service led by Elder Rhonda. So, the church will be open. Will be available, but it's going to be a prayer service for those that are um, volunteering for Hope in Des Moines, for the children and for the families that's going to be impacted by being there, Hope in Des Moines, which is in partnership with Back to School Iowa. Um, so we will be here, but we'll be on also at the Grub Y as well. So if you are led to come in and pray, you better come in with your prayer strong and mighty in Jesus' name, because. This is the part when we talk about Matthew 20 and 19 to go. Man. This is the go part of that. 
And so we're going out into the land. We're going out into the field. We're going out um, in faith, by faith and through faith, through all the things you've heard tonight. So we need people at the base camp praying for us. Um, you want a biblical example? Yes, Moses sent out the 12 spies to go see the promised land. Guess where everybody was at, else was at? Back at home base. So just saying, only sent 12 um, to do that. So pre please, 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 please start praying now. <laughs> Continue to pray now um, as we go through it. Even pray through the event and even afterwards that the effect will be there. But if you desire to vo volunteer, please hit that volunteer link so that apostle knows um, when you're coming and what have you. So that is what we have for tonight. Um, is there any other things I need to say about Sunday? Yeah, we probably need to be Okay. Okay, now I'll work. All righty. So with that being the case, is there anyone who wants to pray us out this evening? All righty. Go ahead and pull that young mic close to you, ma'am. Lord, we just thank you for today and um, the beautiful day that you gave us today. And we just thank you for all the blessings that you've given us today, Lord. And we just thank you for the Bible study tonight and all who in the house and who are listening that um, you, whatever it is that you wanted us to learn from it. We just thank you for helping us of the understanding of what was taught tonight and um, just to continue letting us grow and understand your word, Lord. And we just thank you and um, safe travels for those who are traveling and just let us have a beautiful day on Saturday at the fair for Spirit Midwest and um, a beautiful day on Sunday for Hope. And we just thank you and love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.